Yeah, thank, thank you for being here. Uh, there's a lot of really good talks going on right now, so I really appreciate everybody showing up. Um, yeah, uh, like I said, my name's Adam Hendel. I'm a founding engineer at, at Tembo. We're a, a startup for a managed Postgres solution, um, and we're building the Postgres deployments specific for, for workloads, and one of those workloads is message queue. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that today. Um, so yeah, first uh, we're gonna walk through kind of like the origin story, how did uh, this, this project come to be, um, and then some other use cases, maybe why you would use a message queue. Um, message queues on Postgres are like super popular and a little bit controversial. Um, there's a lot of projects out there, so I'm gonna kind of walk through some of those a little bit. Um, and then the, this project, we're gonna walk through its API and some of the underlying operations that actually get, get uh, executed when you work with the queue. We've done a little bit of benchmarking so far, um, and that's super important, important but uh, we're gonna walk through those. And, and well, I have some recommendations for like, how you could run this yourself. And if we have time, uh, I'd probably do a live demo. So let's get started. Okay, so uh, th this project started because uh, at Tembo we were building our cloud platform and uh, we had this architecture where we have a control plane and the control plane is like the back end to the, the internet. It's like our, our UI, our CLI, the company's API, Terraform provider, all those services talk to this control plane. And, and then there's a data plane, and the data plane is what manages Postgres and all the data services. And these are two separate Kubernetes clusters, and we can't always guarantee that the control plane can communicate with the data plane. So we wanted the data plane to be able to reach out and pull, uh, pull events in. So we are like, a queue is perfect for this. Uh, and we, you know, we're a Postgres company, so we built the queue on Postgres. And at, and at the beginning, um, you know, our, our whole stack is, is primarily Rust, so we, we built the queue in Rust. And it was a Rust, uh, a, a Rust library to begin with, a crate. Um, and then later we wanted to make it more available to not just Rust projects, so uh, we built an extension out of it. And there's a framework called PGRX, we use that to, to build this extension. So yeah, what, what can you do with a message queue? Well, there's another extension that we built. It's called PG Later. It lets you do asynchronous query execution. Um, and this was like the second thing that we used PGMQ for. How this extension works, uh, there's, there's an API in SQL. You pass in a SQL query, and this extension just basically takes that and puts it into a PGMQ queue as a job. And then there's a background worker that executes, uh, pulls the queue for, for that job and executes it. And then when the query is done, it puts the results in a table. So it's, it's really simple, um, but having PGMQ around as, as a, an extension made that really easy that we could just pull it in as an extension and we didn't have to like rewrite a bunch of code. Another use case for queues is batch processing. Um, so, so here you have like a client and a web server. Client is maybe has really high traffic, high throughput traffic, and we want to keep everything low latency. So the web server, instead of do, doing a bunch of compute, it just takes every request and drops it into a queue. And then you can have a batch processor that, on some schedule, maybe every minute, maybe every hour, takes all the messages from the queue, and either does like a batch insert or maybe summarizes the data and updates a table or compute some aggregates and updates a table. Um, at, at a previous job, we, we did just this. Uh, we weren't using Postgres at the time, but we had uh, driver data. So we had GPS coordinates that were constantly coming in and they would come in at very, very high frequency. And we didn't care necessarily that we had every point, but we wanted it to be able to have like the quantiles of where the vehicles were over time. So we tracked the, all the clients, pushed all the location data in that built up into a queue, and then we actually stored aggregates. 
So it was like the, the average, the, the, the median um, of all the lat long that all these vehicles were driving at. The alternative there would be to you know, have this web server you know, somehow buffer these or try to maybe do some pre-compute on the client side, but that kind of got to be a little, little dicey. So the queue worked really well for this. Okay, so the extension we built, we named it PGMQ, kind of a boring name, um, but it's easy to recognize. Um, what we like most about it is that it's, it's very simple. Uh, there's no external, any additional external work processes or workers that you have to run. Um, other, other service, other queues out there, like you might have to run a maintenance worker in a separate container or a separate process that kind of watches over your queues and manages the vacuum for you or cleans up records, anything like that. Um, PGMQ, it's, it's, it's all just SQL. Everything is done by the producers and consumers. So that means it's very low operational maintenance. You don't have to like deploy a bunch of stuff to, to run this extension. The other thing that I think is pretty unique, um, and we kind of were inspired to do this from Amazon's SQS product and Redis Simple Message Queue, is the visibility timeout, and I'll talk more about that later. But uh, that gives us exactly once delivery within, a, within this window. And for certain use cases, having exactly once can be very, very important. Um, API is like super simple, like I said, so developers that we've uh, shared this project with really like it because it's really easy to understand. It's straightforward. Uh, it does support single message and batch, batch operations. Um, and like I said earlier, it, uh, it started as a Rust crate and then became a, an extension, a Postgres extension. <clears throat> okay, so this is not the first queue on Postgres. Uh, how many folks here have heard of PGQ? Great. How many people use PGQ? Cool. Um, yeah, that's probably like the original queue on Postgres, at least as far as I can tell. I don't know. It's, is that right? Is it wrong? Yeah, yeah. So it's like the OG. Um, uh, but that, that project doesn't do exactly once. Um, and it does have like the background workers, correct? Maybe? Let's talk afterwards. Yeah. It definitely has external processes that you, that you have to run. Um, but it's a very good project. Um, there's a project out there called Postgres Message Queue. Um, recently, a, a project called River was released. It's a message queue on Postgres written in Go. There's PG Boss. It's a JavaScript project. Uh, Crunchy wrote a really great blog a while back on how to build a message queue on Postgres. Dagster wrote also a great blog of like, hey, you don't, uh, don't use Kafka, use, just do your message queue on Postgres. So there's like all sorts of different ways to do this. Um, you know, and, and you know, I think there's, there's probably use cases for, for all of these, um, but we really like our project because we think it's so simple and easy to run. Okay, so we're gonna walk through, well, well first I'll, I'll talk about like what a visibility timeout is and then we're gonna walk through the API, kind of like what actually happens in Postgres. So the visibility timeout, like I said, it's is inspired by SQS. So this isn't a thing we invented. It's a, you know, somebody else invented it, but we implemented it on Postgres. And it, it is a timestamp that the message becomes available to be consumed. So, you can imagine, um, uh, like when you when a message gets sent to the queue, there's a timestamp, some point in time that the sender can say, "This is when I want the message to be able to be consumed." So most of the time, you set that to like right now. You send the message and say it's immediately ready, but you could say like, "Hey, I'm going to send this message now, but I don't want somebody to consume it for five minutes." So it's it's on the queue, but it's invisible, and then just naturally as time goes by you'll eventually reach that visibility timeout and then say, the message is, is available. So then on the consumer side, when you read a message, 
you tell the queue, hey, how long do I want this message to be invisible before I want my, myself or another concurrent consumer to be able to read that message? And that, so that amount of time, that becomes the window that you get exactly once delivery. Um, and really what you want to do with that is have it to be like some duration longer than, it, than you would expect it to take you to actually like successfully process that message. So if this were like some message that you're going to receive and you need to do some video processing on it or something, you would probably want a longer visibility timeout. Um, but if it were something like really quick, like an email, maybe you'd set it to something shorter. Um, but then you can also come back and uh, like update that visibility timeout. For, like if for some reason it's taking you longer to work with that message, you could come back and say, you know, give me another hour, give me another minute to, to work with this message before I want it to, uh, to become visible again. Um, but what's nice about this is if you don't, if your consumer doesn't communicate anything back to the queue, the visibility timeout will naturally expire without any external process working on it, and then the message becomes visible again. So, you, so once that visibility timeout expires, then you kind of become in this uh, at least once delivery, delivery mode, but you don't get into um, the at most once where you could have data loss. So, yeah. Okay, create a queue. So to, to create a queue, you just say uh, select PGMQ create, and in this example, we just create a queue and it's called prog. And then what happens underneath is we, just, we create a table that has some columns, the message ID, the read count, how many times the that the message has been read, the time that the message was, that the message hit the queue, the visibility timeout, and then the message itself. And right now, the only, the only data type that is supported is, is JSONB. Um, and then there's, there's also some indexes created, and uh, uh, an archive for that queue is also created, and indexes on, on, on the archive. So since the message ID is the, the primary key, we, we basically end up with two index, indexes on the queue, on the message ID, and the visibility timeout. Uh, yeah, so to, to send a message, it's like super simple. It's just an insert. Uh, you set the visibility timeout uh, on insert and the message. So vis vis the visibility timeout, like I said, is usually like now, so that it, it's immediately available, but you could set that to some point in time in the future. It's really simple. So that means is like basically whatever write throughput and latency that you would expect out of Postgres is like what you would get out of PGMQ. There's not really anything going on here that would make it faster or slower. So yeah, so each queue, it's basically one table um, aside from the archive table. And this is you know basically what it looks like. Three records on the table, hello world, zero, one, and two. It's pretty straightforward. Reads, okay, so reads, here we'll read one message from the queue, we'll set the visibility timeout to 30 seconds, so that means we read it now, we have 30 seconds to do something with this message, otherwise it's gonna be consumed again if there's a concurrent consumer. Um, and we, it, you know, it supports batch read, but in this example we're just gonna say, just give me one message. But reads now, so reads do all the work. Every, pretty much everything unique about this project happens right, right here. So if you've read any of the blogs that are out there, there's some things that probably stand out to you. So for update, for update is kind of what guarantees that uh, we're not gonna have duplicate consumers get the same message. So as soon as that first consumer gets it, it's locked and uh, another consumer's not gonna be able to read it. Skip locked is there. So that lets us have concurrent consumers reading, and the additional consumers don't actually get slowed down. Like they'll they'll skip over this this record. <clears throat> and then we we increment the read count every time we read a message, and 
uh, update the visibility timeout accordingly to whatever was passed through from the API. Um, yeah, what else here? Uh, so the so you might notice there's also like there's a CTE here. Um, maybe at the end if we have time, but so there's actually this bug in Postgres that I don't understand, and if anybody has an idea how to do that, where or understands. Um, if you have uh, a for update and a skip locked and a limit statement on there, you can actually get any number different than what your limit is. But if you put it uh, in a CTE, yeah. Oh, it is. Well, th this is how you reproduce it. Okay. Yeah. I, I honestly don't understand. It's way over my head. <laughs> Oh boy, how do I get back to full screen on this? Hmm. I just go full screen? Yeah, there we go. Okay. All right, so there's a CTE. Um, deletes, so deletes are pretty simple too. It's just a delete from the table. So performance here is gonna be pretty much exactly what you would expect from a delete in Postgres. Archives are a little bit more complicated though. Um, archives, I think, are super valuable when working with a queue. And basically what we do is we delete the message from the queue, but then we insert it to an archive table. And that pretty much serves as an audit log, like a free audit log that you get out of that table. That's been super valuable for us at Tembo because there's so many times when we like see something that happened last night or something, and we want to go back and see, well, what was, what was actually the message that, that came through the system? So instead of having to like search our log maybe large messages out to our logging system and search through that, we can query Postgres, we can query the archive table and get at every message that was gone through our system. So these are more expensive than a delete, obviously. <coughs> um, so yeah, the, this isn't the whole API, but that's like primarily the, the main operations that people use when they work with PGMQ. But there's also pop. So pop, uh, it's a little bit more dangerous because it, it deletes the message from the queue at the same time that you read it. So if you only, if you don't need at least once delivery, if you like at most once is fine for you, pop could be great because um, it just deletes the message right when you read, when you read it. Um, I think I mentioned earlier there's set, you can set the visibility timeout so that could be like, hey, I'm processing this message. Turns out I need more than an hour. I need more than a minute. You can reset the time, the timeout on that to either later or say, hey, I'd, it's, I want to return it to the queue right now. You can purge queues, just wipe out a, a queue pretty easily. Um, and then we do have docs. So uh, if you want to see the, the complete API. Okay, so some benchmarks. So these are pretty early um, and kind of hard to read, so I'll try to do my best to explain this. A um, Couple things to note. So PGMQ does support partition queues, and we just uh, basically use another extension for that. It's called PGPartman, um, but all these benchmarks are on non-partition queues. And, and just as a note, uh, the partition queues are primarily there to deal with bloat, table bloat. So as we can just kind of roll off partitions and uh, you know truncate partitions that have high high bloat in them. So we're not we're not quite we just haven't got to the point where we're benchmarking those yet. So so right now we're just starting to benchmark the the standard queues. So here's a one hour benchmark. Uh, the the host size it's 16 uh, vCPUs, 32 gigs of RAM. Tiny message, 22 bytes, so that's like hello world. Uh, so that's really small. Um, five concurrent producing processes and 40 concurrent consumers, each doing batches of 10. Um, and this, so this benchmark ran for one hour. Uh, all these benchmarks, we, we ran them from a EC2 instance within the same region as Postgres was running in. And, Postgres was in Tembo's cloud platform. Um, so, okay, so if we look at, look at the plot, there's a, the red line is the select one latency. 
So that kind of represents like, hey, this is like maybe what's coming across the network. I like to keep this in there because I'm, a, I'm an application developer and I always, my apps are never on the same host as Postgres. So I always like to benchmark that and just kind of see like what's the network doing. Um, but that, that can also give us an indication like if something really bad inside Postgres is happening, like if we can't even do a select one. <clears throat> um, so in blue, you can kind of see it in the background. That's the, that's the, the right latency. Um, and these are aggregated the, by the second. So it's the average per second. So blue is, is, is pretty steady uh, at roughly three milliseconds for a batch of 10. Um, and then, you know, a millisecond-ish more for the reads and the, and the deletes. So what, I, what I'm really looking for here is, well, what I don't see is like a giant spike in latency over time. And my concern would be like, hey, am I not handling bloat properly? Because if I weren't, we would probably see this like start to really degrade, latency really de degrade over time. Um, so, you know, latency was kind of like in the three to five millisecond range. Uh, and overall, that was like an average of, you know, just under 20,000 messages per second, which these are tiny messages. So maybe that's not surprising for Postgres. But that also tells me that, like, Postgres is probably good enough for most workloads, most Q workloads, um, at least with small message size. So another hour-long ben benchmark, in the only thing difference here is we increase message size to one kilobyte. So we do see a, a little bit more variation. Um, and the, the gray lines here, that's the, the queue depth. So if we were producing messages faster than we can consume them, we would see the queue depth go up. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but what this does tell us is during this benchmark, like we were consuming at roughly the same rate that we were producing. Um, but yeah, so also, also here, like this looks fairly healthy to me. Like we don't see a degradation in performance over time, at least over a one hour time period for messages of uh, one, one kilobyte. Okay, um, so in this one, yeah, let me think, what do we do here? So we went back down to Small message size, 22 bytes, uh, but we decreased uh, like the, how much load that we we're putting on. So 10 producers producing one message at a time, and then 30 consumers consuming 10 messages at a time. Um, so everything was like way more steady at about you know two and a half, two and a half milliseconds. This is also a, an hour-long benchmark, but we we brought the amount of load down quite a bit. So this is under 5,000 messages per second. OK, so this is, this is like what would be like the bad case. So we disabled the auto vacuum and said, like, just don't do it. What happens? I think this is what most people are afraid of happening when they think about a queue on Postgres. So if you disable auto vacuum, yeah, it's going to be you know, pretty bad. Um, but that's a, a, that's a consideration to you know, keep that in mind when you do run a queue on Postgres, because if, you, if you're running other workloads on the same instance uh, that you're running your queue, and if you have like a really, really long transaction running, maybe the auto uh, vacuum gets, you know, blocked for a little while. And, you know, if it's like a <laughs> five hour transaction for some reason, like you, it could have a big impact. Well, it, it will have a big Im impact if you have high queue throughput. But I think there's still hope here for Q on Postgres um, because if, like, I don't have benchmarks for the partition queues, but in those cases, auto vacuum is kind of less relevant. Okay, um, so conclusion here, like, okay, these are early benchmarks. Uh, I think we can do better on our benchmarks, like, a little bit hard to interpret some of that stuff. Um, I'd like to run the benchmarks longer. I'd like to increase message size even bigger than one kilobyte. Um, also want to, like I said, I want to benchmark partition queues still. Um, but like the takeaways, vacuum is absolutely critical if you're not running partition queues. 
Um, I think latency is low enough for just about all Q, um, Q use cases on Postgres, and throughput is also going to probably be good enough for 99% of the planet as well. Um, but the general guideline, and this, uh, this, is, this holds true for just about every Q platform in existence, keep message sizes smaller. The more data that you're trying to send, the slower things are going to be. I think there's just not really a way to get around that. If you have one gigabyte size messages, like even Kafka will, and RabbitMQ are going to be slow. Um, but batching helps a lot. Uh, you can batch messages, batch messages into SQS. You can batch messages, uh, you know, in Kafka, and, and it helps. And it, the same as in, in Postgres. So you can kind of tune that to your to your workload. And at least for right now, um, I think the recommend my recommendation is to like if you can, and you uh, run your message queue on an isolated compute. Like probably don't run it on your data warehouse if you have a Postgres data warehouse. At least not today. Okay, um, so if you want to run a message queue, like a, a message queue as like a world-class product, um, Tembo does this now, and this is, this is what it looks like. And this is, a, this is all open source. Um, the link is, is in, the, in the bottom here, but Tembo has a managed Postgres solution, and there's, there's more than just Postgres and just uh, um, just the extensions that are in there. So there's a lot of applications out there that maybe run like at the edge that can't make a database connection. And um, HTTP might be the only way that they can communicate with another service. So having some sort of interface for that available um, opens up the door to lots more use cases for Postgres as a queue. Um, there's a really easy way to do that. You really don't have to write any code. There's a project out there called Postgres. Anyone familiar with that? Anybody from the team here? Yes? Ah, well, tell them thank you. It's a great project. Yeah. Yeah, Postgres is awesome. It's basically like a service. You run it, and now you have a, a, a REST interface to your Postgres instance. There's like months of work in my career that I could have just not done, probably, if I had Postgres. Um, OK, then, connection pooler. PG Bouncer, uh, there's other connection poolers out there. I can't really speak to them, but PG Bouncer is great. Uh, it's what we run on our message queue stack. Uh, metrics and alerts. So Postgres has lots of things you can alert on, but there's things that are unique to queues that I think are also very critical. Queue length being one of them. That can be like the first indicator that something is going wrong. Like if you're, if, if you're, for most use cases, if queue depth just like, just starts to skyrocket, it usually means something somewhere is bad is happening. Um, and also the age of messages. Like if you are expecting a consistent throughput and all of a sudden like the last message in your, in your queue is five days old, that means you haven't been getting any traffic. Um, that could also be an indicator. Of course, the extensions, already talked about these, PGMQ, PG Partman. Um, Postgres config. Uh, we run shared buffers at like 60% of system memory. That's pretty high. Um, but at, when it's an isolated instant, um, instance, you know, that, that could be okay. That could change. I don't know. We'll maybe learn over time and that maybe that's a bad idea, but we'll see. Um, and then auto vacuum, of course, I talked about that and run Postgres on a dedicated, or run, run the queue on a dedicated instance. Okay. So what's next for the project? Uh, we got a lot of bench work, benchmarking work to do, I think. There's probably still plenty of people out there that aren't going to be convinced that, like, yeah, you should do a queue on Postgres based off of what I shared today. Um, so I think we owe, we owe that to the community still. Um, some of the community contributors to Postgres started working on um, what we're calling a bridge. It's basically a way to connect PGMQ to external queues and to other Postgres queues. Uh, alert. Some sort of alert and notify implementation we want to do within the next year as well. So right now it's not not supported. Everything is a your consumer has to pull. Um, but if we can have something more of like a push, I think that would be really useful. 
And I think really, uh, like the main reason Rust is still a big part of the project is we want to support more than JSON B. Um, and we're not sure how we're going to do this yet, but there are libraries in Rust uh, that can make it easier to support things like Message Pack or Avro, Protobuf. But we'll kind of see what, what happens there. Okay, so I have to thank a, a few people who I've never met in person, um, and they're not here today, but uh, or, uh, PGMQ is primarily maintained by the Tembo, the company I work for, but these three folks kind of just came out of nowhere and started contributing to the project, and they've had really, really good feedback and made really, really good commits to the project. So, um, you know, uh, maybe they'll see the recording, and, you know, thank you so much. <laughs> Okay, I think we have, yeah, I think we're good on time. So we can do a uh, little bit of a demo here. Let's see, let me blow this up. Hmm. I think I could maybe get even bigger. Is that good? Been way in the back? Okay. All right. Okay, so let's uh, let's just see. I, I, let's see if there's any queues already in existence here. So, okay, so there, there's no queues yet, and I, I'm just running this locally. This isn't like in a production environment or anything yet. So let's create this uh, prog queue. Great. Um, and now let's send a message to it. Actually, let me see if I have. Sent here. Okay, so we'll send a hello world message to the queue. Great, we got the message ID back. Message ID one is what we sent. Amazing. Um, okay, now we'll let's read one message. So the the third parameter here is the quantity of messages we want to read, and we'll set the visibility timeout to 10, 10 seconds. So we sent the first one, or we read that, and if I read again. Hey, we don't we don't get anything. Um, we saw the query before, so we're you know have a condition on the visibility timeout. The message that's on the queue is invisible, but I think 10 seconds has elapsed now. So if we read again, there we get it, and you can see it's it's been read twice now. Okay, so this this is message ID one. So we could um, archive message ID one archive from the prog queue, and we'll archive message ID one. Okay, true, we archived it, and if we archive prog, there. So um, we don't have an API around the archive yet. Um, we're still kind of thinking through what that can or should look like, So, but it's just a table. You can query it. Um, so what we did is we basically deleted the message from the queue that we created, and now it's in the archive here for forever or until we delete it. Um, yeah, and that's, that's a simple message queue on Postgres called PGMQ. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. Thank you for the talk, it was great. So have you considered various options for toasting or storing the metadata, so the message on a separate table instead of in line with the metadata for uh, the queue control? Yes. Um, we're pretty sure we'll probably end up putting it on a separate table first. Um, but, I mean, we're open to feedback on, like, how we can better handle any, any of that, how it's, how it's stored. So, I mean, if you have ideas, I'd love to talk to you. Sure. Yeah, but... But yeah, definitely probably moving it to another table is, is the first thing. And now that the API has got to a stable place, like we can do that and it's not going to be disruptive to any people currently using it. Yeah, so first, I love Postgres. Second, I love Rust and PGRX. I'm, I'm wondering, though, how much Rust is actually needed for this? Because this seems to be um, almost pure Postgres. You alluded to that 
for future things like the, mm -hmm. the, the other types of messages you want to do. How much of this is Rust? Uh, I think still maybe 75% of it is still Rust. It doesn't probably need to be. There's not no. like, oh, this must be Rust. Um, it was really easy to port it um, and like change it from a Rust crate to a Postgres extension. Like it was like a day of work to do that. Um, and then there's some code that's shared between the 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 client library in Rust and then the extension. So it, it's kind of like out of convenience. But the these operations here, the one they're PLPG SQL now. So there's not really a a big reason like why this must be Rust. But PGRX is is pretty good to work with. So, and that's a Rust a Rust project. Um, so like all the integration tests are written in Rust, um, and PGRX makes makes that experience pretty good for us working on the project. Yes, you mentioned that uh, the VT uh, column is indexed, and that perhaps there are more indexes. Uh, I'm wondering. Uh, have you looked if the updates that you're doing on the queue are hot or not, as in keep optimized? Uh, I don't know. Um, I know that it's probably going to have a big impact on, on things, but we haven't quite got there yet. Yeah, so that was going to be my question. So yeah. you discuss out of vacuum that affects directly, but uh, so you haven't played yet with the fill factor then? Fill factor? Yeah. Uh, no, not yet. Okay. No. Nope. Yeah. The, the, the different. Postgres configs that we, we do set, there's a link to those. They're in a public repo. Um, but fill factor is not one that, that, that we've changed yet. OK, we discuss. Okay. Are there more questions? You see right screen? Yeah, there. Thank you. So you did mention for your previous company, you got a lot of metrics uh, in, in your queues in this case. Some of them were useful, um, but if they expired after some moment, they weren't useful anymore. Um, is there some sort of feature in this where you can say, all right, so if the message is older than 10 seconds, it doesn't matter and we're just throw it away? Uh, there's nothing built into the PGMQ API that does that. But what I have seen some people do is within their application, they will query the table first and then determine whether they actually want to delete a message or not. So like underline, like they just basically go around the API and, and run a, a query directly to the table and then decide what action they're going to take. So for example, they might uh, query the uh, query and filter data from the message itself first and then say like, oh, I actually, uh, there's no messages that I want to consume right now. But it, yeah, it's a little bit immature there still. The API doesn't have anything for that directly. Hi, it's me again. Hello. Uh, yeah. so, so you mentioned uh, that you are thinking about more data types. And uh, are you thinking about creating new data types for PG in Rust, uh, like the JSONB column or PG vector, and maybe more data types? Or are you thinking about just serializing messages into whatever storage that's already present? The, well, what we are hoping to be able to do is store the data um, and not have to like deserialize on the fly. But the users would be able to like just have an experience of saying like, "I'm running like my data is Avril," um, and then we store it in whatever format we can. But it's mostly for like the external API, um, and I'm not sure we're not sure how we would do that yet. Like how we would actually store it in Postgres. Um, maybe we'd have to make a new data type. Maybe not, but you, you, you think we would? Yeah. Is it? Yeah. To like have a protobuf data type in Postgres? Yeah, that would be pretty cool. I don't know how we would do that, but you know, if maybe I can figure it out. Maybe speaking of these type of um, serialization formats, just binary would also be great because then you would be able to support um, encrypted messages. So you're a middleman or middleware, sorry, and then uh, the, the consumers and producers can just uh, message each other without you knowing about the content. Yeah, that that would work work too. So like from the developer perspective, they would just send binary data and then we just, yeah, that would be good too because I didn't think about that. That's a good idea. The question here. 
Uh, uh, thank you for the talk. My question is about exactly once. Uh, you implemented using this uh, visibility timeout, right? Uh, question is, what happens if uh, during the processing of this message, uh, something happens and server restarts? Uh, Postgres server restarts, so the uh, message uh, should be like, uh, what happens with visibility in this case? So it, it, I would expect the, the, the message would stay on the table. Uh, and if it restarts, then you know, when it would ever recover, the, the visibility timeout should still be that in, the initially set value. Um, so once recovery happens, it would be visible then at that point. And it would no longer be exactly once. That would be like at least once. Okay, good. Okay, another question, Cedric. Thank you for the talk. I just, I'm not sure I understood about PG Partman and partitioning. Where and why do you use it in a, in a PG MemQ? Yeah, uh, so it, it's kind of a strategy to, to deal with the table bloat. So the idea would be partition the queue by message ID, for example. Um, the, the way the API is set up, you can either partition by message ID or by the enqueued at timestamp. Um, so you could set the, each partition size to, I don't know, 100 messages. That, that's probably too small, but um, so then, and then also configure it to say like, uh, once, a, a queue, once a partition is empty, just truncate it, just get rid of it. Um, so then, you know, you'd write 100 messages to a partition, and then when that's full, you'd start writing to another partition, to another partition, and then instead of having to vacuum them, you just once you move off the partition, you just you just drop them. So it's kind of like you just go around the bloat problem. So I think it's it's kind of a clever solution. We just haven't, you know, got to it yet. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah thank yeah. you. <laughs> all right. Okay. Well, I think that the discussion was very interesting because the topic is very interesting. I hope that you got also uh, nice ideas for future yeah. work. Thank you for the picture as well. Really nice place. Yeah. I come from there, so. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so last applause for Adam. Thank you very much.